أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين بائث الأنبياء والمرسلين صلى الله وسلم عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله وسلم عليك يا نبي الله وعلى آل بيتك الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله وسلم عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا ابن رسول الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا غريب يا غريب يا مظلوم كربلاء ما خاب من تمسك بكم وأمن من لجأ إليكم ويا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي ونفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال الله تبارك وتعالى وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم واخشوا يوما لا يجزي والد عن ولده ولا مولود هو جاز عن والده شيئا إن وعد الله حق فلا تغرنكم الحياة الدنيا ولا يغرنكم بالله الغرور آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah the most kind the most merciful it's due to that kindness and mercy that we have these opportunities where we gather in remembrance and glorification of him tabarak wa ta'ala we then send our condolences to our 12th and living imam al-hujjah ajalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif and to each and every one of you as we commemorate today the Arba'een or the 40th of the Istishhad of Aba Abdullah al Hussein and his companions alayhim abdalu salatu wa salam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that we all get an opportunity to go for the ziyarat of Aba Abdullah and that we receive their shafaat in the hereafter. The day of Arba'een is a very important day, a day of renewed grief on the family of the of the Prophet when they returned back uh, to Karbala and all of that pent up grief that they had that they weren't allowed to let out because of the abuse they were facing at the hands of the oppressors when they finally reached that location that Karbala where the graves of their loved ones were they were able to fully renew that grief that they experienced on the day of Ashura. And so today, even though we are not present in those lands, we grieve with them and we mourn with them. And there is great significance in this mourning. So I think we should all collectively uh, just say as Assalamu ala al Hussein wa ala Ali ibn al Hussein. وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين. May we all get a chance to go very soon, inshallah, for this ziyarah. Today is a day of grief, but it is also a day in which we can take some lessons to try to improve the quality of our lives so that we are more connected with the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. And I think one of the important questions or one of the important points of reflection when we look at the tragedy of Karbala you know is that how could a group of Muslims yeah, because they were Muslims yeah, they were people who prayed they were people who fasted they were people who read the Quran they 
they went for pilgrimage. How could a group such as this fight the grandson of the Prophet? Now, this is a really important question, right? Like sometimes we look at it between Haq and Batil, it's absolutely true. It's a battle between Haq and Batil, it's a conflict between Haq and Batil and life in itself is a conflict between Haq and Batil. But the people on Batil are not atheists. Yeah, they're not people who deny God. They're not people who don't believe in the Risala of Khatam Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ali. Allahumma salli ala Ali. These were the same people, many of whom who had seen the Prophet. And these were many people who had heard from the Prophet. These were the Tabi'een. They were, if they were not the immediate uh, companions, they were those who followed in the next generation. And so they heard first hand or second hand statements of the Prophet like Husaynu Minni yeah, wa ana min Husayn, that Husayn is Sayyidi Shababi Ahlil Jannah. All of these statements, how could a group of people forget all of these things, believers, and fight? And or more so than that, you know, not just fight the grandson of the Prophet, but at the same time forget the admonishments that God had made of how to behave like a human being. You know, the behavior we see in Karbala um, of how bodies were trampled, yeah, or one body was trampled, yeah, how they looted the women and children, how they imprisoned the women and children. These are characteristics of a, of a humanity that has been deprived, yeah, a humanity that has been removed from people. How could a people who believe in God and the admonishments of God behave in such a manner? You know, it's interesting, sad in many ways that, you know, it, it said that during one of the battles at the time of the Prophet, uh, there was a, the Prophet had instructed his companions that do not take the prisoners that you take from this battle through the battlefield so that they see their loved ones. He says, we are not animals like this. Yeah, they don't need to experience that. And look at what they did in Karbala. Yeah, that these people who imprisoned the family of the Prophet purposely took them through the battlefield so they see their loved ones in that manner. Everything Islam had taught went out the window yeah, and they forgot what was expected of them. And so the question is, how could that happen, right? 50 years after Risala ended, yeah, 50 years is not a long time, right? And, and I think this question is really important to be quite honest because we need to ask ourselves that how do we make sure that we don't behave in a similar manner? I don't think any of us would say that we would fight the Imam of our time when he would come, at least right now. But I swear to you, if you had asked those people, would you have fought Imam, none of them would have said yes, yeah, because they knew him. But when it came down to it, when it became the, the time to make a decision, they picked the wrong side. How can I be sure that I won't pick the wrong side, you know? Fighting the Imam of my time is, is something that never even crosses my mind, right? And I'm sure it never crosses our minds. But the measure of our faith to God is determined by how committed we are to what God wants, right? So yes, I will not fight the Imam of my time, but when Allah says, don't do this haram thing, do I avoid that haram thing? Yeah. When Allah says, I expect you to do this, it is wajib. Do I pick and choose and say, well, let me see if I want to do it? My lack of commitment to God yeah, is in many ways following the same footsteps that these people followed in Karbala. Yeah? They picked and choose yeah, when they were going to follow the commands of God. Yeah? These people on that night of Ashura prayed. Yeah? On the night of Ashura, it wasn't that they were just drinking and drunk. No, they prayed Salah. You look at the companions of Hur who met Imam salam on the journey, they prayed behind the Imam and later fought the Imam. So they picked when they wanted to submit to God. But when it came time to following the commands of God in every other way, they chose not to command, follow the command. And so this is something that to be honest, it's something that's scary. Yeah, it's scary because when we look at our lives and if we're really honest, we find that sometimes we do pick and choose. And that this is convenient for me, so I'll do it. This is not convenient, Allah, I'll change later, for example, right? And these are not characteristics that we as believers should be having. And so we need to ensure that we take the right steps. The verse that I quoted in the Quran, uh, from the, in the khutbah, it comes from Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah 31, verse number 33. Allah Azza wa Jal says in this verse, 
Ya ayyuhan nas, O mankind, ittaqu rabbakum. Yeah, be conscious of Allah, have taqwa of your Lord. We'll talk about what is taqwa, right? But we understand it's about a sense of consciousness, mindfulness of God. Wakhshaw and fear yawman la yadzi walidun an waladi. And fear the day when no father shall atone for their child. Wala mawludun huwa jazin an walidihi. Shay'a, and no child will atone for their father on that day. He's talking about obviously the day of judgment. Allah says, Ittaqu rabbakum wakhshaw, and fear the day of judgment. Inna wa'adallahi haq. Indeed, the promises of God are the truth. Fala taghurrannakum al hayatu dunya, wa la yaghurrannakum billahi al gharur. And do not let the, the delusions of this world distract you. Nor let the distractor or the, the 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 distractor distract you, meaning shaitan. This verse is important for us. It's important for us because Allah Azza wa Jal gives us the two criteria that are required to be successful and the two criteria that will cause us to fail in this world. Yeah. And so let's break this down because then we will analyze it from the question that we asked that how could a group of Muslims do this, right? The first thing that will bring us success in this world, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ittaku Rabbakum. Yeah, have consciousness, have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Taqwa, you know, it, sometimes it's translated as fear, but it's really fear of the consequences of abandoning my connection to God. Yeah? But really what the real definition of taqwa is, is just mindfulness, consciousness. And what that means is that at all times, I am wary and mindful of what God expects from me in this situation. Yeah? That I don't lose focus of that. That no matter what I'm going through in life, you know, I, I truly believe that if we remembered God more frequently, we wouldn't do many of the things that we did. Right? But the problem is, is that when it comes time to, to act and when it comes time to make a decision and it's hasty, for some reason, we don't remember God at that moment, right? And so we end up acting based on our desires. Like, you know, a simple thing, like in the morning when it's time to wake up for Fajr, the alarm is going off. If I at that moment remembered God, first thing, if I remembered God, I don't think I would turn off that alarm and go back to sleep, right? But what do I remember at that time? My bed. Yeah, that's what I remember. And that's why we turn off that alarm and go back to bed and say, Yalla, I'll get up in five. And then we never get up in five, right? But I didn't remember God at that time, right? When it comes to, for example, someone is yelling at me, someone is fighting with me. You know, like when someone yells at us, that yelling of that person is not a fight. That person's yelling at me. It becomes a fight when I yell back at that person. Yeah, it takes two people to fight. Yeah, and so at that moment when someone's yelling at me, if I remembered God, I would behave better. But what do I do? I remember my ego. I remember my anger. And so I respond back. Now there is a conflict between me and that person. You can easily walk away and there'll be no conflict, right? So in these moments of, of decisions, right? We need to learn to remember God more. And if we do, then that's taqwa. So clearly it comes after having faith in God. It comes after um, increasing my connection to God because remembering God more frequently requires a deeper connection with God. And there's a simple tip, you know, a simple thing we can do. We can actively remember God more frequently. That if I remember God in times of ease, Allah will remind Himself of me in times of difficulty. Yeah, this is a really important point. Okay, that how come I forget God in times of heat? Because I'm not remembering God in times of ease. Right? When things are going well, how often do we thank God? How often do we remember God? Right? But when I get a flat tire, you better believe I'll remember God. Yeah. When something doesn't work well, you better believe I'll look up and be like, why? Right? But if I appreciated God at all times, the fact that my car started, Alhamdulillah, the lights turned on, Alhamdulillah, I'm able to get up, Alhamdulillah, new life today, Alhamdulillah. If at all times I'm remembering God more frequently, 
when things become more difficult, Allah will remind Himself to us, right? And we will be more God conscious. So the God consciousness is an ingredient of success that we need and we just have to start practicing it more. The next ingredient of success Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is what? وَخْشَوْ يَوْمًا لَا يَجْزِي وَالِدٌ عَنْ وَلَدِي And remember that day when no father will atone for his child, meaning no father will help their child, nor will any child وَلَا مَوْلُودٌ هُوَ جَازٍ عَنْ وَالِدِهِ شَيَا And no child will atone or help their father. I want you to picture this scene, yeah? Because this scene sounds like a scene of chaos, right? And of course, when we look at the description of the Day of Judgment, it's chaotic, right? It's chaotic. Every soul is worried about themselves on that day, right? In this world, you know, I will think of my family. I will think about the hunger of my family. I will think about the well-being of my family. And in many instances, I will sacrifice my well-being for the comfort of my family's well-being, isn't it? Of course, yeah? But on the Day of Judgment, Allah says, no one will care about anyone else, right? Because you're worried about your own hisab. And I think sometimes, you know, we think, no, I'll do it. I'll help my child. Allah says, inna wa'adallahi haq. And that's what he says right after. He says, my promise is the truth. No one will care. A father will not care about their child. A mother who has the most compassion for their children will not care about their children on that day. And nor will the children care about it. This is a day that Allah says, fear it. Yeah, Fear it. Why? Because on that day, you will receive accounting to the most precise accounting you will ever receive in your life. Right? Everything that we do in this world has an effect. Sometimes that effect we see in this world, sometimes we don't. Like a simple act, if I have a sitting on, if I'm sitting on a chair and someone more deserving comes who wants to sit on that chair, if I get up from that chair in this world, there may not be an effect of that action. But in the eyes of God, there was a huge effect that happened. I will feel the reward of that on the Day of Judgment, right? Everything, every look I have, every, every statement I make, everything that happens will happen, it will, have, will be accounted for. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fear that day, be mindful of that day. And so in this world, Allah says the two steps of success are what? Remember me more often and fear the day when accounting will happen. And so if we keep these two things in our minds, and are able to guide our lives based on these two points and everything I do will be the way God wants it to be. Everything, right? I will never transgress because I'll be mindful of the accounting and I'll be mindful of what God wants from me. These are the two steps of success. However, to attain this, Allah says you have to be mindful of the two pitfalls. Yeah? The two things that distract people from following through with these. What are these? Allah Azza wa Jal says about them. فَلَا تَغُرَّنَّكُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا يَغُرَّنَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ Do not let the world deceive you and do not let the deceiver deceive you. These two things counter those two points we mentioned earlier. Let's look at these, yeah? That the things that prevent me from being God conscious, the things that prevent me from fearing the day of judgment is ghurur, yeah? Delusion, right? It is being deceived by things. What are we deceived by? Allah Azza wa Jal says, first, people are deceived by this world, yeah? He says, فَلَا يَغُرَّنَّكُمُ الْحَيَاةُ dunya." Do not let this world deceive you, right? How does this world deceive us? You know, this world deceives us how? I think it deceives us by the promises of what is available in this world. It deceives us by that, you know, that if you just, you know, we've all heard and seen pyramid schemes. Yeah, you just invest this much, you'll get that much. And it sounds so great. Yeah, you sound so great. Like might as well do it. I don't have to work again. That's, there are people who fall for it. Yeah, but nothing in life is like that. And honestly, like nothing in life is like that, right? Not, no free money is coming, falling from the sky. You have to work in this world, right? But there are promises, the promises this world makes, right? The possibilities that this world offers, 
right? To say, look, you want wealth, all you have to do is this. You want fame, all you have to do is this. You want power, all you have to do is this. You want status. These things are constantly presented to us, constantly, right? And if we fall for these things, it becomes very difficult to come out of that rat race or that cycle to see that this is in fact not reality, right? Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, he's reported to have said, Sukrul ghaflati wal ghurur, that the intoxication of ghafla, negligence or heedlessness, and ghurur, delusion. Abadu ifaqatan min sukril khumur is more difficult to wake up from than the intoxication of alcohol. Yeah? The intoxication of delusion is more difficult to come out from than the intoxication of wine. Right? With wine in a day, maybe that person is not drunk anymore. But a person who falls victim to delusion, these cycles of promises, oh, you can get this, you can get that, you can get status, you can get this. This is what the world that we live in unfortunately promotes, isn't it? If you look at social media and all of these influencers, what do they promise? Quick success, quick fame, quick this. And so many of us are falling victim to it. So many of us want to start now posting, want to be a trendsetter, want… Why? Because they have promised us things which in fact even those people who are posting them are not getting, right? Well, if you ever looked at, you know, like uh, like pictures are so deceiving, you know, so deceiving. I remember like seeing sometimes like a, a video of someone who was taking the picture. There was this couple who was fighting and then the wife just said, let's take a selfie. So in that moment, they both smiled and looked like they loved each other. Yeah? And as soon as they stopped, they went back to fighting. Right? But the world just saw that loving picture. Right? I've had, I know people who when they enter the plane, they'll just stop in business class, take a picture, act like they're sitting there, then they move back. Yeah? Mm -hmm. The world thinks that, mashallah, look, they are flying first class or business class. And, but in fact, they're sitting in economy like the rest of us, right? But these delusions have an effect on us. Now, I saw my friend flying business class. I want to fly business class, so I put myself in debt to fly business class, right? Why? Just so that I can try to be like someone else. These are all examples of how delusion and how the world is constantly just trying to, to sway us away from where we need to be. As believers, our ultimate goal with dunya is to live it so that we can secure our akhirah. Yeah? It doesn't mean we can't have fun. We can have a ton of fun in this world, right? But as long as that fun is within the boundaries that have been set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm telling you, I think many of us can attest to this, if not all of us can attest to this. We can have a tremendous time in this world while still maintaining the boundaries set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So who is it that gets deceived by this world, right? The one who gets deceived by this world are those who don't, are not mindful of Allah and they don't fear the day of judgment. Those two things that Allah talked about first, that have, fe have consciousness of me and fear the day of judgment. If I do not have these two facts or two concepts secured in my heart and in my mind and in my faith, then this world will always trick me, yeah? This world will always sway me. But if I'm mindful of God, if I am conscious about the day of judgment, then I will see the reality of this world. You know, I think one of the things that we have to understand about this dunya is that this dunya has never lied to us. It's never lied to us. We hear all of these traditions, right, yeah, that the dunya is layinun masuha qatilun summuha imam ali salam says right that it is soft and pleasant to touch like a snake but it is filled with venom inside this is the reality of dunya it's not that the dunya hides these things from us yeah dunya has never lied to us yeah dunya has never tricked us on purpose right imam again he says in a very beautiful hadith he says o oh, you who insult the world yeah o oh, you who insult the world you know, who insults the world? The people who try to get it but can't get it, isn't it? Yeah? Otherwise, why would we insult the world? Yeah, the world is, alhamdulillah, it is the way it is. 
right? It is sometimes fair, it's sometimes not fair. It is the way it is. But who insults it? Those who want it, can't get it. Ah, lanat on dunya. Yeah? Why? The Imam alayhi salam says, Oh, you who insult this world, it is you who have been deceived by its deceit and cheated by its falsities, and now you insult it? Yeah, the Imam says, you went for it, you didn't get it, now you want to insult this world, now you hate this world. The Imam continues, he said, why should you accuse it or should it accuse you? SubhanAllah. Should dunya blame you for being not mindful? Yeah? Should dunya blame you for being so gullible? Should dunya blame you for not focusing or should you blame dunya? Dunya should blame us. He then continues, when did the dunya ever deceive you? SubhanAllah. Dunya has never lied to us, my brothers and sisters. The only reason we fall victim in this world is because we're not mindful of God and we don't fear the day of judgment. But if we feared the day of judgment and were mindful of Allah, I would live this world with the mindset that everything is about securing my akhirah. That's the main thing. And so if this quick scheme sounds too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. Yeah? If this quick scheme is not going to help me secure my akhirah, then why should I even fall victim to it? Why should I even chase it? Right? And so the first thing that we have to be mindful about is that we do not let this world deceive us. The second thing Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَلَا يَغُرَّنَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ and do not let the deceiver deceive you. Yeah? Who's the deceiver? Shaitan. Yeah? Iblis. Yeah? Iblis is the master deceiver. right? And the army of Iblis. The shayateen. Right? The shayateen. You know the word shaitan comes from the word shatana. Right? Shatana means something which is vile or harmful. Right? And so Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran, when He describes the shayateen, He says, Shayateen min al insi wal jinn. Right? So sometimes human beings can be shaitan. Right? Sometimes jinns can be shaitan, the way Iblis is. And so if I, for example, am a bad influence on someone, like I keep telling them, let's go out, let's do this, let's do that, in the eyes of God, I'm a shaitan. Right? Because I'm trying to harm somebody. So sometimes we have to be careful, you know. We blame shaitan, but I could be the shaitan, right? And so shaitan deceives us how, right? Like Allah says that وَلَا يَغُرَّنَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ How does shaitan deceive us? I think shaitan deceives us first by, by making what is prohibited attractive for us, right? Like, is our haram things attractive? Yeah, of course they are. Right? <laughs> Otherwise, why would anybody like go for it? You know, if 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 something haram was really like nasty at the same time, if God had done that, none of us would do anything haram, right? If Allah had put like a poison in haram things, none of us would go do it, right? But there is a spiritual poison. But in this world, it's quite attractive, and this is the tool of shaitan. Shaitan promises this. Allah says in the Quran that when him and shaitan iblis were talking, what does iblis say in Surah Al Hijr? Verses 39 and 40, uh, he says, Qala Rabbi The fact that you have put me in this path of damnation, basically. That I will make this world attractive for them and will guide, misguide as many as I can. Right? He will do this. He will make this world attractive for us. And so one of the ways that shaitan deceives us is again by making certain of the dunyawi things real attractive, right? Why do you think people sin? Because it is seem pleasurable. It is seem exciting, right? But if a person is mindful of God, they'll be more careful about the deceptions of shaitan. But here, you know, I think another way that shaitan deceives us it's not just by making things attractive for us, you know. I think sometimes as a believer, even though these external things are attractive, like we're not really tempted by them because we've been believers long enough, right? Like I know, for example, right, um, like that these things, yes, they may seem fun, but 
I can hold off by not enjoying them. I'm cool with that, right? Like I'm alright not doing that. As believers, we should have that much iman now where we don't fall victim to haram things so easily, right? Um, then how does shaitan deceive us again? By making us complacent in our iman, yeah? Shaitan will look at us and say, MashaAllah, you're a mu'min, what else do you need to do? Yeah, MashaAllah, you have Jannah, you're a Shia, Jannah is wajib for you. And so I don't try to become a better mu'min. Right? And if I stop progressing, I'm automatically regressing. Right? This is how Iman works. Iman is fluid. Iman is not stationary. Right? So Iman moves and movement is forward or backwards. If I'm not moving forward with my Iman, I am automatically moving backwards with my Iman. Right? And so these points I think are really important for us to understand that these two things are the causes of people to fall victim. To go back to that original question, how could a group of believers fight the grandson of Rasulullah? Yeah, it's because number one, dunya deceived them. They were promised the governorship of Ray, so they said, I will fight the grandson. They were promised wealth, so Shimmer said, I will fight. Yeah, they were promised status, so other people said they would fight. All of these things were promised to them, right? and because of that ghurur, they fell victim. And secondly, shaitan deceived them. Yeah, they made their actions attractive to them. And in the heat of the moment, when you look at the depravity with which they acted, this was because shaitan made these things seem pleasant to them. Look at what they did to Abu Abdullah. Yeah? How could a person, after you have harmed him, killed him, slaughtered him, now you come and loot that body? Yeah? Now you come and remove the clothes from that body? Yeah, one mal'oon we are told when he saw that there was nothing left on the body of Hussein, he saw a ring on the finger of Hussein. And what did he do? He took a knife and cut the finger of Abba. How can a human being behave in this way? Because shaitan makes it attractive for them. Yeah? Shaitan gives them that energy. If we can be mindful of those two things, my brothers and sisters, number one, mindful of God at all times, and number two, that we are mindful and fearful of the day of judgment, then inshallah when our Imam comes, we will not be the same as those who fought the Imam of their time. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa Ali Muhammad. We are in this day of Arba'een, a day in which we said it's a renewed sense of grief. And so today we cry, cry for Abu Abdullah, cry for Zainab salam today. We are told that when the family was leaving Sham, it's hard to imagine how that family left. And when I think of that departure, you know, I think of Rabab at that time. <laughs> that Rabab had lost a son in Karbala. And she had to leave Karbala, but she had no choice but to leave Karbala. She had left her husband in Karbala. But she had a young daughter with her. <laughs> but that daughter was left in the dungeons of Sham here. <laughs> How would Rabab leave her daughter? I always think of that moment when Rabab was being taken back towards Karbala. That how did Imam al-Sajjad convince her? How did Zainab convince her? But Rabab came and we are told that before the family reached Karbala, a companion Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari reaches Karbala before the Imam does. We are told he went to Karbala with his companion by the name of Atiyah. When he reaches Karbala, Jabir first goes to the river Euphrates and performs his ghusl. And then he puts on fresh clothes and applies Atar on his body. And then who, Jabir, who had almost lost his eyesight at that time, he says to Atiyah, Atiyah, take me to the grave of my master Hussein. He went to the grave of Abu Abdullah alayhi salam and he says, Jabir, he says, Atiyah, make me touch the grave of Hussein. He touches the grave of Abu Abdullah and we are told Jabir falls unconscious at the grave of Hussein. 
Atiyah says, I sprinkled water on the face of Jabir and Jabir woke up chanting, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. And then he pauses and then he says, Habibun la yujiba habibahu. And why does the beloved not answer the call of his lover? But he says, How can you answer when your veins have been cut from your body and your head has been separated from your body? And he begins to recite a marthiya in poem at that time. And then Atiyah from a distance sees flags coming towards Karbala. He says, Jabir, I think the army of Ibn Ziyad is coming. Jabir says, go and check. After a little while, Atiyah comes back slapping his face and says, Kom ya Jabir, stand up Jabir and give your condolences to Imam Sajjah. <laughs> <laughs> Jabir says, Sayyidi Adam Allahu lakal ajri biyabika al Hussein. I give you my condolences on the martyrdom of your father. Wallah, Wallah, I think at this time that the Imam broke down. The Imam hugs Jabir. Why did he break down? That from the time the Imam left Karbala and Kufa to Sham, there was no one to give condolences to the Imam. There was no one to sympathize with the Imam. There was no one to give him a shoulder to cry on. But finally a lover of the Ahlul Bayt he meets and he says to him, Ya Jabir, Ha huna kutila this is where my father was killed. This is where they burned the tents. This is where the children of my father were killed. This is where the women were taken prisoner. Uh, after showing Jabir and breaking down and crying, the Imam says to Jabir, Jabir, it is time for you to now leave this area. <laughs> Why? Because Zainab wants to go to the grave of her brother. <laughs> Zainab alayhi salam, we are told, falls onto the grave of her brother Hussein and cries out, Wa akha, wa Husayna, wa Habiba Rasulullah, wa ibn Makkata wa Mina. She begins to lament at the grave of her brother. She begins to cry and inform him of all of the things that she she had to endure the chains on her hands, the chains on Sajjad's neck, how the hijab was removed from their head, how they threw stones and water at them from rooftops, how they saw them play with the teeth of Abba Abdullah with a stick. And then she must have told him, Oh Hussein. That amanat you had given me, I left that amanat in charm and it did not return back to you, O <laughs> And then one by one, the ladies and the children, we can imagine this, my brothers and sisters, began to recite their own marsiya, their own azar. How they must have remembered. <laughs> that when Qasim wanted to go for battle, <laughs> that Hussein looked at Qasim and began to cry. <laughs> and now Qasim embraces Imam Hussein and they both cried and cried until Qasim began to kiss the feet of Abba Then let me go now. How oh, they must have remembered how difficult it was for Hussein to let Ali Yunil Akbar go. How Rabab must have remembered that when Hussein said, Hal min nasin yansuruna, that from the cradle a child cried and said, Labbaika ya Hussein. <laughs> and then when they cried and lamented, 
Zainab then looks towards Imam Sajjad and says, Yabna Akhi, take me to the grave of my brother Abba. <laughs> and they go to the grave of Abba. And now Zainab must have said to Abbas and Abbas after you, they did so much to us. <laughs> they hurt us so much. They oppressed us so much. Oh, but she must have said, Abbas, after you, I became Abbas for the family. <laughs>